All right. So my name is Rita Larkin. I am the communications director for the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. And you might wonder what is the connection between the foundation and the Blue Ridge Music Center. Um, since 2013, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation and its donors have supported programming at the Music Center in Galax, Virginia. Um, that support ranges from concerts that are held uh, throughout the summer on Saturdays, great shows, and the outdoor amphitheater you see behind Marianne right now. It's a great place to see live music and admire the mountains. And then we also do additional programming like this Deep Roots Many Voices series. Um, it's designed to give greater insights into American roots music, bluegrass, country, all the great sounds that have come from the mountains. And um, so this is just one of many programs we've done and we wanted to share it with you. So I will hand that over to Marianne Kovach. Hi, I'm Marianne Kovach, the Associate Program Director for the Blue Ridge Music Center. Um, as Rita mentioned, one of the things that we do here is a concert series uh, that are held in this amphitheater that you can see behind me. Um, the, our concert series happens during the summer and actually kicks off this weekend uh, with Tuba Skinny on May 28th, so we hope maybe some of you can come and join us. Uh, next week, we're premiering a collaboration between Dory Freeman and the Winston-Salem Symphony String Quintet, and on June 18th, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation with a concert with the Kruger Brothers and the Contras Quartet. For the full schedule um, and other information about the Music Center, please visit our website at blueridgemusiccenter.org. Today, we're talking about Deep Roots, Many Voices. Um, this video that you see includes segments from musicians that we spoke with as part of this discussion series that focuses on inclusion and diversity in American roots-based music. Um, this, the, the, this video highlights many of the topics we covered in, this, in these conversations. After the video, we'll have time for some questions and answers, so stick around um, and give me just a moment, but here is the video. Hello, I'm Richard Emmett, the Program Director of the Blue Ridge Music Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our discussion series, Deep Roots, Many Voices. This series is part of a project by the Blue Ridge Music Center exploring diversity and inclusion in roots-based music. In this discussion series, we pair two musicians in each episode to talk about issues related to race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, how these issues have been part of their personal stories, and the importance of celebrating diversity in the music world. These discussions highlight contributions to American roots-based music from the many voices that make up our nation and give us hope for a rich and diverse musical future. The series was coordinated and conceived by Blue Ridge Music Center Associate Director Marianne Kovach, who also moderates these discussions. I hope you enjoy the series. Thank you for joining us. And now here's Marianne to introduce you to our guests. Hello, I'm Marianne Kovach, the Associate Program Director with the Blue Ridge Music Center. Welcome to Deep Roots Many Voices, a project to explore issues related to diversity and inclusion in American roots-based music. The project includes discussions with five pairs of musicians and following are brief passages from these discussions, highlighting the topics we covered. The video includes snippets from our conversations with Reese Palmer and Dom Flemons, Charlie Lowry and Puda Fay, Sam Gleaves and Joe Troop, Earl White and Trey Wellington, and Joseph Kwan and AJ Lee. Links to the full discussions can be found on our website on the Deep Roots Many Voices page. Thank you for joining us, and here is our highlights reel. But the thing that really kept me um, centered was my purpose and my purpose who's very much wrapped up into my indigenous um, lineage both my mother and father from being the Caribbean Indians and and North Carolina so yeah because of everything that was going on 
in terms of environmentally and um, in every way you can imagine. And I was always aware of what um, all indigenous people of the world were, what they were up against. I, I knew that at a very early age. And so that was very important to me. And so when music, when it came time to like really write, and uh, I'd say Buffy had a lot to do with that. And uh, so that was, that influenced me. And um, so I really wrote a lot of very hardcore, um, heartfelt, um, what some people would call protest songs, but I don't call them protest songs. They're just songs of, of my people and my family and, you know, so yeah, that's a, that's enough of an answer. I started to feel like every time I sang that song that I was coming out to the audience. And it was sort of a way that I could come out and I was introducing this and saying, this is someone else's story that I've written, but he has the same first name that I do. And he, uh, you know, there are some similar elements in our experiences. And I started to feel really nervous sometimes when I was going to feel like I had to come out to an audience. If I looked out at the audience and thought, okay, this doesn't look like a, you know, I mean, visually, you know, sometimes you step out on stage and you, you see faces and you wonder, you know, where the, where is everyone coming from? You know, am I going to be able to reach people if I come out in uh, a song, you know? And I started wearing a rainbow banjo strap when I was in college as well and started to sing some of the traditional songs from with pronouns that I identified with, you know, just started singing a love song. If I was going to sing a love song, I would just sing it with he, him pronouns the way that I felt it. So and in Pretty Little Rainbows, uh, I kind of talk about the little groundhogs waddling to and fro under the trapper's watchful eye and singing, you know, you know, letting their pretty little rain rainbows shine from atop tall bridges and through the heart of all religions. Well, this is one for all the Appalachian queers out there, all the little purdy rainbows. But really, the, the song, I, I, I wanted to write that for the little purdy little rainbows shining in dark places. Like the two cent queers and pork chop queens, this is a song to celebrate the muse and you. We've got that good old Not the San Francisco fried. some like it gays. Not to fried. like them. A bacon pancake. You know, because I mean the rain takes it takes different the converging forces in order to push a movement forward. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are in the trenches. You know, that are in places where their sexuality, their sexual identity is not an asset. In fact, it's very uh, controversial. And those people rainbows, are brave. They stick it out. And those are the pretty little rainbows. So I wanted to write that song for them. It was kind of cathartic. Also, using that language is is fun. I love I love some of the bluegrass language. Uh, I, 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 this Appalachian English is, is is interesting in how you can you know kind of uh, it, it combines like a level of humility and uh, and grace with a very powerful message sometimes and i i do i do glean that out of this tradition old time music is it's not a black music it's not a white music you know it was a music that was always played together uh otherwise how did the black musicians learn from the white musicians and how did the white musicians learn from the black musicians we were dancing at the uh angiers festival once and uh the bill monroe band was backing up the uh green grass cloggers and bill monroe walked over to me and says you know you remind me a lot of this fella i used to play with years and years and years ago but he didn't mention a name and yeah, part of that too is 
you know, you see a lot of pictures of uh, black people playing the banjo or black people holding the banjo, playing the fiddle or whatever, but usually there's no name associated with that person. So, uh, you know, with it not being a music that is, there's a ton of black people in that a lot of the time the black community does not hear about these artists. Uh -huh. And I definitely, um, today, you know, I, a lot of that is like, you know, with um, rap and hip hop, you right. know, um, a lot of people associate like, they want to call like black, like hip hop and rap music, like black people's music. Right. And, you know, music's not a race. It's a, it's a form of music, you know, like anybody can play any kind of music they want to, if they want exactly. to, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, definitely, I just think taking these stigmas away that the musics are to a certain race is a very important thing in growing. Oh, very much so. Start um, just in thinking about Dark Water Rising because we played more of a contemporary style of music with traditional elements in it. Um, sometimes people didn't really know how to take us or what to expect. Um, and our name threw them off. Upon seeing our name, they thought we might have been a rock and roll band or a heavy metal band. <laughs> and then uh, we were fronted by uh, three females uh, myself and two of my other sisters. Um, and it just took, took, people didn't know how to take us, but then when we came with messages of love and hope and, um, just messages that all of humanity can relate to, I think people enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, we had some people that were expect when they found out we were an all native band, they were expecting the drum or flutes maybe, um, and we did incorporate some elements into our shows. I usually always played brown skin with the hand drum. Uh, but, you know, it's like when people read your bio or see your picture and find out you're native, they expect a certain thing out of you. And so it was always nice to catch them by surprise and, uh, you know, also include elements of who we were as, as tribal people. When you're an artist, you are a little bit of a gatekeeper and you have an opportunity to bring like these, the four gentlemen that play with me in my band are from different genres and have played in different places. And country music is not necessarily, country and Americana is, is not necessarily something that they've played before or that they've been involved in before. And so now they have this, this, these, these, like Merle Fest and Newport Folk Festival and some of the other things that I'm going to be involved in, um, they can add to their resumes. And now they have that experience. And so now they have an opportunity to, if you know they decide they don't want to continue to play with me, they can go off and find someone else. And hey, listen, I've played country. I've played Americana. I've done Merle Fest. I've done this. I've done that. And it adds to their resume, it adds to their experiences, and it adds to the places that they are represent that we are represented and that we can go in. And I never thought about it like that until recently. And it's like, I don't think a lot of musicians think of it that, that way, because everybody's just very intent, as you should be, on picking the best person. And I'm just very lucky that I got the best people, and they're the best people, and they also happen to be Black people as well. And so like everybody wins, but I think that there is something to thinking about bringing other people like you that wouldn't normally have that experience and opening up a world of opportunity to them as well. And so I hope I've communicated that well, but, um, yeah, I, I, you know, but as far as like the audiences and stuff in, are concerned, I mean, most of the people that listen to my music, quite frankly, are like, I call it NPR listeners. I'm an NPR listener, but it's mostly like it's grown ups and <laughs> a lot of them are white and um, and there are black people in the audience as well. 
But um, I, I've come to terms with that for now until more outreach is done and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, that's what the audience is. You know, one black performer at a venue, for instance, that's, you know, not really going to change people's perception of the music. You know, you have to get more and more black people starting to be a part of these events on a regular basis. Um, and it's, um, I, you know, in the music, in, like especially in the bluegrass and old time music industry, it's hard because there's not a lot of black performers. But, you know, the more black people you can get into it, the more kind of ways you can, you know, a lot of people, I think it's important to kind of step away and, you know, you might have to go in some other routes to get people to come in that are more diverse, you know, like you might have to get people who are more of like Americana or folk and um, that might be black playing the music. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of getting those audiences in because, um, you know, as I've been to concerts where it's just like an all white crowd and, you know, sometimes it is a little, you know, alarming because you don't know what's going to be said and like if something is said are you going to be able like who's going to have your back there it makes a huge difference for me on stage uh, to see uh, people of color out in the audience it's very rare you know um, it's no secret that the Everett brothers are there's a lot of Americans who are mostly white at our shows. And I have no, no problem with that whatsoever. Obviously I wouldn't be in the band if I did, um, but it does always bring a huge smile to my face when uh, I see, you know, like an Asian family with their kids sitting front row. Uh, it just inspires me to like be a better person on stage just so that I can be someone that, you know, I, I know what my parents would say. It's like, oh, look at that guy. He's, he's just like you, you know? And so that, that enters your brain, even though, you know, you try really hard for these things not to enter the conversation when you're up there making, uh, making music, creating art, you, you really don't want it to be about, about this, you know, racial thing that might be there. But it's hard not to as you get older and as you start to realize, you know, these are things that, that as, a, as a young person, I, I knew I, I was pushing down, I was suppressing, you know because I, wa I wanted to assimilate, because I was growing up in rural North Carolina, I didn't have, I had like five Asian friends, you know, they all went to my high school. There's like maybe five of us that went to my high school. And, and so it was not something that was celebrated uh, as an early musician, as an early artist. Um, and it wasn't until in a way, you know, finding oneself or figuring out who you are as a person that that started to matter more. Um, and now um, it's hard for it not to matter. You know, I, I see through a different lens than I had before just because I want it to matter, you know. Like going forward, like I think after after having some of the experiences that I've had mm -hmm. and and getting older and that sort of thing, I think I realize the importance of reaching back, yeah. not just looking back, but reaching back and making sure that you're not only glorifying yourself and talking about, you know, how great what I'm doing and the, but like letting people know what the motivations are behind what you're doing, letting people know what the inspirations are behind what you're doing and that you're not the first person to have a lot of these ideas. And so rather than take all the glory for myself. And yes, isn't this a great idea that I just had? It's like, actually, I'm standing here because of this, 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 and this. And mm -hmm. you should check that if you want to understand me or understand this time or understand whatever, this is, this is the source. That's this right. is the start. And like, this is where, and I think that's really important. And so all of a sudden I found that my job wasn't just playing my music and doing glorifying me, even though I enjoyed the music, I'm playing it, mm -hmm. I want to get some credit. I found that also there was a need. There was a yes. need to create awareness. There was a need to tell stories 
that could enrich the audience in a way that they might not even know. And, and, and at times I found that they've been really wanting it, not even knowing mm -hmm. that this was a part of the history. And I found that the intention of what I was doing changed. All of a sudden I found, here's my work, but my work can also be uh, telling people about another artist, mm -hmm. telling people about a, uh, an article or an album or some other thing that helps just deepen the experience, especially if they're into what I'm doing. Here's, here's, here's and part two, three, four, 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. But then sometimes that puts you in a tough position because I have had uh, sort of friends talk to other friends about, you know, well, if you have some kind of platform and you're reaching people, then why don't you talk about these issues or why don't you, mm -hmm. you know, say something oh, yeah. else? And it's a hard place to be because, you know, as musicians, entertainers, you know, you're trying to create a, a good time for everyone of all different backgrounds of all different ethnicities of all different types so it it's a really big step for those uh, artists who take that leap and use their platform to address different issues but you know for for some artists you're you're just in the background like you're saying you know you don't really want to engage because you're here to do what you think your job is and it's to you know make everybody happy and you know have everyone you know come together sort of on issues instead of maybe you know create a more uh more of a divide within your audience yeah especially but the music has a power to bring people together and you can connect with people who are very different from you and i think that's the really important work like what joe was describing you know if you sit down in a fiddler's convention and you're willing to listen and be be gentle in a way and to acknowledge that we're all coming from a different perspective and we can still enjoy playing music together even if we don't have the same political yeah. orientation or you know back you know there's there's a lot of potential in music for healing and yeah. for connecting across divides um not that we should ignore those divides or not that we shouldn't work to create justice in the world. I mean, I certainly believe we should, but I think maybe part of how we do that is by genuinely listening to people that are different from us, you know, which is hard to do, hard for me and hard for everyone. Thank you, everyone. So we are going to get into a few questions. If you have any questions now, you can still enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I thoroughly have enjoyed this series, and I think we wanted to mention that it did culminate in a symposium, and we will put a link to that symposium with some of the artists um, in the chat. But I, Carolyn, I'm sorry, uh, Marianne can speak to that a little bit more. But um, I did have the chance to kind of tune in for the symposium and I did feel like I was among some really amazing stars. I was a little starstruck with all the interviews. So I wanted to ask you, Miriam, what it was like to pull this together and, and, and hear from all these artists. 
Well, it was really a great experience. Um, one of the things that really impressed me was how open and honest all of these musicians were that we spoke with and how willing they were to share their stories. Um, there was a lot of things that came out in these interviews that really kind of opened my eyes about things and also in the symposium. Um, really the discussions of how their identities informed their music was, was kind of interesting. And, um, you know, there was things like with Reese and Dom really talking about reaching back and looking at who was in the past and making sure people are aware of the fact that people of color are not new to the music, but they're a part of the entire history of the music, which, you know, a lot of times people didn't realize. Um, and kind of bringing some of those influences into the present was really an important thing for them in their presentations. Um, so we just there was just a lot of really fun things that came out in talking to them all. And I was really happy with the, everyone who said yes, they would participate. That's great. And you're kind of carrying this theme throughout the concert season this year, right? Yes, we are. And actually, we started sort of with that with last year. So um, last year's concert season, we had a couple people, um, like Trey Wellington was in our, our concert season last year, um, and we had and Joe Troop was in our concert season last year. Uh, this year, we do have both Reese Palmer and Joe Troop coming on, uh, I don't have the date in front of me, let's see, on July 23rd. So they'll be, you'll get a chance to see both of them if you come on out to a concert with us. But um, we are also, this this whole thing, piggybacks on something we did the year before, which was women in music. And so we really try in our programming to include a lot of women, to include people of color, people with different kinds of viewpoints, as well as different kinds of music. So, you know, this year we have the music from New Orleans, we've got bluegrass, we have Americana, uh, we have, uh, you know, all different kinds of things like that. And we have some old time as well. And Last year, we included some more kind of like early country kinds of things. Um, and so we tried to have a variety of types of music, as well as a variety of different kinds of people coming out to play to play at, this, at the music center. That's wonderful. One of the things I enjoy about going up there is seeing people dancing. It's just great to see people enjoying the music so much and dancing in front yep. of the stage. Yeah, well, we have not only does a tuba skinny tends to attract a lot of dancers, but we also have one coming up with um, Five Mile Mountain Road and the Earl White String Band. Earl White was also one of the people who was in the, this video series, uh, and they're going to be—they're both old-time bands, and so we expect to have to put out the dance boards on that one and have people out in front of the stage all clogging and square dancing throughout the evening. That's going to be a great one. That one is the weekend of Fourth of July, I think. Yes, it is. All right. July second. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank you, everyone. We're at our time. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Marianne Kovach is at mkovach at Blue Ridge Music Center. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's at mkovach at brpfoundation.org. And she is happy to answer any more questions. Um, thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you again soon. Take care.